Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today, we have the always amazing Dave Speck joining us. How are you, Dave? I'm great. Thanks for having me back, Tracy. I am so excited for today's conversation. So those of you that watch the show will have seen episodes with Dave before. If you haven't, Dave is the director of Global Family Business Institute at the Drucker School of Management. And today we are talking about succession superheroes. I am so pumped for this. So Dave, before we dive in, can you tell our audience a little bit about you and what you do? Sure. Um, so I, I became really interested in working with family businesses a long time ago. I was in graduate school. Uh, I needed one class to graduate with my uh, master's degree in finance and tax. And the elective happened to be, Tracy, family business management. And it kind of blended the financial and non-financial issues. Um, and so I, I, it kind of piqued my interest there. And then when we moved to Nebraska, I was surrounded by these fantastic farmers and ranchers. And, and uh, so I really started focusing on the issues that's, that happened to, uh, you know, connect with farmers and ranchers and and, and uh, for me it was all about trying to preserve their relationships and perpetuate those farms and ranches and so um, yeah currently I'm at the Drucker School of Management and now I'm not working only with farmers and ranchers but uh, you know all kinds of businesses all over the place. Excellent and you are a published author as well we featured your book on the show before can you just share more about that too? Sure. So the first book I wrote is called The Farm Whisperer, which for, for this audience would be really good. Um, in that book, we talk a lot about a lot of the non-financial challenges of passing a farm from one generation to the next, you know, whether it's relationship challenges or governance issues, um, shared ownership, you know, all the all the things that we seem to get hung up on. Um, and then the second one is just a more more general book. It's called The Family Business Whisperer. Um, for more of the general audience. I love it. Okay, you sort of touched on this already, but why is deliberate succession planning so important to you? And it's a hot button in this industry. So can you touch on that? Yeah, well, the, you use the word deliberate. And the, the reason we have to be deliberate is because it's the last thing anyone wants to do. And unless we choose to do it, we just will put it off. You know, most of most of your audience, they're great at farming. They're great at building a business. They're great at whatever it is that that makes them money and they're successful at that. But when we talk about business transitions, most people don't do a business transition, but one time in their life. And anytime you have to talk about your own mortality or um, navigate conflict with maybe there's multiple kids that want to come back or shared ownership with some kids that are on the farm, some kids that are not. It's just, there's a lot of things we want to avoid. And so unless we're, unless we're deliberate about it, we'll just put it off until, you know, until something bad happens and we have to face it. So yeah, th those are a few reasons. I hear you. And everybody we interview says the same thing. And all the farmers I know, except for the ones that are really on top of their game, feel the same way, right? Yeah, it, yeah. The hard stuff. <laughs> Nobody naturally likes to dive into the hard stuff. It's like, okay, another day, another day. Yeah. Okay, so I would love for you to share the three kryptonite points that you have. So clever. And I'm excited to dive in. Do you want to start with immortality? Does that make sense? Yeah, assumed immortality. So um, I wrote a little article um, called Succession Superheroes. And there's some superhero archetypes that I use to kind of have fun and to depersonalize how we look at ourselves. And one of those, um, one of those archetypes was Captain Immortal. Hmm. And uh, this is the farmer that you know, just does not view their own mortality. And, you know, it's other people that, you know, have accidents or pass away or have health issues. And this, you, we all know these people, right? These are the people that will refuse to plan um, because, you know, they're young, they're bulletproof. Um, and uh, 
so assumed immortality. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, none of us are immortal, Tracy. And ultimately, we will all leave the farm at one point, whether that's um, upright or, <laughs> or horizontal, I guess. Some will die with their boots on. Um, but ultimately, it's, the, it's important that we, we realize what we will leave behind. And if it's a family that we're going to leave behind, you know, what questions do we want to have answered for them? So that they can just grieve if, if something happens to us and we happen to pass away. Um, if it's a farm that we care about, you know, how do we want that land to continue as a legacy? And so oftentimes it's um, getting that person who might be the Captain Immortal archetype to think about how do I create immor an immortal legacy rather than, you know, forcing them to think about their mortality. Let's shift it to how do we immort Im immortalize the legacy that they want to create. So anyways, a little bit of a mind shift. I love that. And you know what? I know a few of those. It's natural. And the funny thing, not funny, poor, cho poor choice of words. The ironic thing is those farmers want the farm to continue forever and ever. They often yeah. don't want to give up control. <clears throat> they don't want anything bad to happen to the farm. Therefore, they don't plan. And the worst part is because they didn't plan, at the end of the game, sometimes the farm falls apart because they didn't plan. So the very <laughs> thing they were fighting to hold on to, and I know this has happened to families I know and mm -hmm. many fa family farms across Canada and the world, right? Because they hold on so dear, they don't want to give up control. They want the farm to stay intact forever and not put it at risk. They don't plan. And then what happens? The farm falls apart. Yeah, it's the very thing that causes the risk, actually, Tracy. I'm always talking about that that continuity versus control. I mean, oftentimes our mouth is saying we want continuity, but our actions are showing that what we really are invested in is control. And so we need to, you know, we need to be honest with each other. And I think peers can be really honest with each other. Sometimes the farm advisor, you know, has a harder time telling someone, you know, you're not really interested in continuity. You're really interested in control because you're not even involved in your rising generation in the banking relationship, um, or you're not allowing them to make any marketing decisions. You know, we could go on and on and on, but continuity versus control. It's an, it's an interesting kind of measurement of where someone fits on the spectrum. You nailed it. And it is more common than not, I think. Okay. Sure. Assumed immortality. Number one. Number two, the good old procrastination. Would you like to yes. touch on that one? <laughs> yeah, so the the second superhero archetype I use, I call him Dr. Sh. And this is a this is the farmer that, you know, understands they're not immortal, but they don't want to talk about their plan. Um they may have the plan in their mind. They may even have a plan that's written, but they don't want to share that plan. They want to procrastinate. They want to put it off because they don't wanna be challenged in that plan. They don't wanna be challenged in that assumption and they wanna have control to be able to change that plan if necessary along the way. Um, procrastination is particularly dangerous with farming because in farming, we, we usually have these illiquid assets. And if you procrastinate long enough that you're not in good enough health, maybe it is that you won't be able to purchase insurance be able to pay for an estate tax or to be able to equalize an estate. And so there's a number of key challenges with procrastinating. I feel like one of the biggest ones though, Tracy, is that people are putting their relationships in jeopardy by not putting a plan together and communicating expectations with their rising generation. You may have a, a talented rising generation that ends up leaving the farm because they don't know if there's a path to ownership or leadership. And so that procrastination, um, again, that's probably a control thing, but um, there's a lot of dangers to procrastinating. Well, and same situation, same farm that I'm thinking of. There's many family farms out there, but the one I'm thinking of, they procrastinate. They know the next generation wants to farm, but they have to go off farm in this case to get work and main farmer. Gen one procrastinates 
And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, I'm ready. And Gen 2's 50 years old and looking around going, I don't want to get into millions of dollars of debt at this point. Yeah. And it's too late, right? So yeah. they had in their head, they didn't communicate. And then it fell apart when the time came, when it could have been a simpler conversation. Yeah. These are courageous conversations, though, Trace. Oh. We shouldn't downplay how hard they are. I yeah. mean, I, I have a lot of empathy, a lot of empathy for these farmers yeah. because, yeah. you know, their whole life is built around it and they don't want to see it fail on their watch. And so sometimes that desire to not have it fail on their watch is actually what leads them to procrastinating putting the plan in place. It's kind of tough. You know, as I said the word simple, I was chewing on that word and wanting to take it back. <laughs> or maybe simple, but not easy because yeah. those conversations and the dynamic, sure. And also we, you know, I know everybody out there knows there might be multiple children and they don't know the situation and this conversation might be easy, but they don't know what to do about this one. So what do we do? We fear, we don't have the information. We go, okay, tomorrow, it'll be easier yeah. tomorrow. We'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. And then Unfortunately, sometimes we know the rest of the story. Yes, we do. Okay, so assumed immortality, indecision number two, and or, sorry, procrastination number two, and number three, indecision. They kind of yeah. all go hand in hand, eh? For sure. Um, the indecision I feel like is connected with the third archetype that I use. And this, this one I call oblivious man. You've probably met one in your life, maybe or two, Tracy. But oblivious man, this archetype is the, the, the farmer that is so busy running their business, building the farm, that opportunities to plan are just flying by. And they don't even, they don't even see it. They don't even see it as opportunity flying by. And um, their lack of um, making a decision and putting a plan in place oftentimes uh, introduces risk into the continuity of the farm because of the relationships. You know, it is the indecision, um, you know, will keep the rising generation from coming back or it may, uh, it may cause them to leave to find other opportunities. Um, so it's tough. The, the indecision also though comes from the fear of disappointing people, especially yeah. people that you love. And uh, again, so I have a lot of empathy for this one too, with that indecision. I can see why there is a lot of indecision uh, with regards to putting these plans in place. But when I look at the cost of not deciding, um, both from a relationship perspective and also from a financial perspective, it's way more costly to not decide. Um, than it is to have tough conversations, make some decisions, and then change course along the way if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's one thing sitting here talking about what needs to be done. And you know, and I know, I've been through it. I've seen good and bad. And it is not easy. There is so much to it, right? So right. much to it. So much to it. Okay. And Dave, I think I might've jumped ahead on point number two. You had an archetype for point number one. Did you have an archetype for point number two? We, we did. So that was archetype number two was Dr. Sh. Oh and yeah. Archetype yeah. Right. Number, Sorry. number three was uh, oblivious man. Okay. But good. we can talk about the fourth archetype because I think this one's really important. Okay. Please do. So the fourth archetype is um, Miss Reality. And uh, I purposely, I purposely used three males for the first one and, and one female for the last one. And this archetype is the, is the farmer that really sees themselves as um, not as the farm, but sees the farm as a picture of, uh, as a part of the picture of their bigger life. This is a, this is the farmer that sees, um, you know, a, a broader context to life and, and actually embraces putting plans in place because it removes um, uncertainty, uh, enhances family harmony, increases the, the likelihood of it passing on. And so for this fourth archetype, we just, um, we just give them hugs and thank them because they're, they're rare. Um, but I, I do believe that in many family cases, um, 
Miss Reality is is the mom in, in a lot of cases because oftentimes mom is caught kind of at the crossroads of being involved in the farming operation, but also being like fully invested in the kids. And so Miss Reality sees the impact of not making decisions, sees the implications of not communicating well. And um, ultimately that's that's the group that I try to get to lead these processes because they can be the, the loving thumb in the back, you know, when things stall out because um, they seem to see the whole picture a lot more clearly. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. uh, biased, Tracy, but that's kind of the way I see it. No. And you know what? I agree exactly with you. And I'm sure everybody in the audience sees that too. You clearly know farm families. It Mom just has dad and okay, we're being stereotypical, but we no, are, I'll, speak, I'll speak from my experience. And okay. we're also speaking to generations of the past. Maybe we're not talking about today's farmers where husband and wife are both on the farm, both working. There's lots of stereotypes, lots of situations, but the farm families I know, my grandparents, it was exactly that. My grandpa, the farm, the mm -hmm. farm, it started there, it ended there. And that's all that mattered. Sure. He loved his kids, but it was, he was a different kind of man, different breed. Right. And my grandma was all about family, equality and harmony Yep. And a bigger picture, right? It was sure the farm's important, but it's the farm and the family. Yes, Miss Reality, that was your grandma. Mm, she was a dear, <laughs> and I think we all know a few Miss Realities that make we the do. farm go. Yeah, thankfully, yeah, yeah. Well, that is great. So we have our three kryptonites. Is there anything else that you want to add? I'm going to get you to leave some final words of wisdom, but stage is yours. If you want to add anything else here to our audience. Well, for me, if I could just wave a magic wand and have every, every farm family have five C's in order, the first one would be to have contingency plans for management and ownership. Like what's going to happen. Um, the second is cash flow plans for that senior generation. So where's their cash flow gonna come from if we expect them to retire? And then the cash flow plans for the farm itself. You know, can the farm afford to invite a rising generation back? So again, contingency plans, cash flow plans. The third one is just communication. If we could have patterns for regular communication with, with the family about the strategy and the structures that we have in place, um, we would remove a lot of heartache. The fourth C is compensation. Talk about how we're paid. Um, it's oftentimes not talked about, especially when we're inviting the rising generation back. We invite them back and we say, we'll figure it out when, when you get here. Mm -hmm. You know, And it's just not a healthy way to do it. And then the fifth one is just conflict and deciding how you're gonna navigate conflict before you're actively in conflict. Conflict is not bad. It just means people see things differently. So contingency plans, cash flow planning, communication, compensation, and conflict. If we could have the five C's in order, Tracy, farming would be a lot happier place. Mm, that sounds almost like a beautiful episode right there. That's great. I'm glad you threw that in. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Okay. That was amazing. I love your kryptonite points and the succession superheroes. That is fantastic. Clever, clever wording to very common situations on the family farm. Final words of wisdom. And if you have any to add, and also how can our audience connect with you and or buy your books? Sure. So the Farm Whisperer is available on amazon.com. It's pretty easy. Um, you can connect with me. Uh, my email is Dave Specht, S P E C H T, at gmail.com. That's a pretty easy way. Um, or you can Google me and that you'll find me pretty easily that way too. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't know how many of our farm friends are on LinkedIn these days, but um, those are a few ways to connect. And I love farmers and I really appreciate what farmers do to feed the world. So if I can do my little part to help a farm continue and a family be happy. I'm all in. Perfect. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your time. I always enjoy our conversations and I will put your contact details, a link to your book on Amazon in the show details as well. So Dave, as always, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tracy. That was fun. Thanks a lot. And you in the audience, thank you for joining us and we will see you on next week's episode. Bye everyone.